Well, welcome back to part two of my Club Kids Chronicles vlog. Um, ready for the release of my new book, my new album, and my new Vidmix collection, Club Kids Chronicles. So I guess I should talk about events surrounding and events leading up to my first suicide attempt. Life became, you know, fairly unbearable straight away after I was arrested. Um, initially, um, I tried to keep it under wraps. I wasn't charged with anything and I was, um, you know, let go. Um, they did question me without a solicitor, I didn't think I needed one. Um, and I gave them the names and addresses of any friends on my Facebook list or anything like that that had kids. Um, so they could just go and ask them and just know that I'd not, you know, harmed anyone. I mean, I was so shocked to be arrested. 
Anyway, while I was in the police station, they raided um, my mum's house, which was very sad. Dad was dad was ill in bed. Um, I wasn't there, and mum suddenly had so anyway. I only confided in a couple of friends what had happened um, and uh, you know a couple of them were great and a couple of them weren't so great. Um, anyway, uh, one person who did turn up trumps for me was Craig who I worked for for so many years or worked with at Fire and Beyond when I was DJing at Beyond and AM and uh, Onyx and you know, my own nights and Jason Streetbox and everything. I'd had a relationship, a uh, friendship, strong friendship with Craig for many a year um, doing my DJ and singing and hosting. So anyway, he'd heard some rumours. I went to see him at fire and he said, well, first of all, he said, let's uh, let's relocate you to Spain away from the scandal and wait for it to die down. Um, and I wasn't sure about doing that. Dad was ill and um, I was worried about leaving mum being so far away. So anyway, look, he, he suggested going to see his solicitor. He set it up for me and he, he paid for it and everything to me to go and see his solicitor who was based in Manchester and she was smashing, she was really, really nice. It was the first time that I'd really had any legal advice at all. Anyway, she didn't think there was too much to worry about. It was all speculation, fantasy writing. Um, photos uh, from Facebook or Instagram that, you know, legally, um, if they was illegal, they shouldn't have been on there in the first place. So look, she put my mind at rest a bit. But Craig thought it's still best that I relocated because of the gossip mongers, because some of the gossip got out. And, um, and so he said, would I like to go to Manchester and start a new uh, a, a new venue for him, being the host, and um, just away from London and all the chit chat. And I just said it was such a fantastic thing to do, a great friend. And I went up to a few gigs for him, and I thought I'll talk about it. But, but um, meanwhile, I I you know cancelled my gigs in London. Apart from one, I thought that I would have it as my last show in London, I'd just written a song for um, for uh, one of the Bobble Box stars, Sandy, Sandy, uh, Sandy and Sandra, the two black girls from Bobble Box, and I'd, I'd just written a song for her, and um, anyway, we we was going to have a launch for it uh, at a really nice venue in London, hosted by the uh, Four Puffs and a Piano from the Jonathan Ross Show, who I, who I worked with a lot. And, uh, and other friends had been already, um, had already performed at this, this venue, uh, which was the venue that Elton John and Tina Turner and loads of people had, had, um, had filmed their videos at. And it was a beautiful venue. And, uh, lots of our friends performed there. Johnny Robinson, who, who'd done a single with us, and Barbara Bush, um, Jessica James, who'd done a single with us. Anyway, they all said it was great. So I thought, you know what, let's make this my last show in London. So I tried to keep things under wraps as much as I could, but unbeknown to me, um, some uh, some of my, a uh, couple of my confidants had, um, you know, had spread the word around in private messages on WhatsApp, etc, etc, and the inevitable happened and it all came out, of course it all came out the week of this show and I was I was rehearsing round with David from the Forklifts and then suddenly his uh, partner came back and they'd been at the ballroom and said that the manager there was going mad who I didn't know and, and had uh, written stuff all over my posters saying that I was cancelled and uh, all this uh, nightmare scenario and all gossip and stuff that um, had started regarding my arrest so um, I pulled out of the show um, obviously because I didn't want anyone else to be affected by it I didn't realise all this gossip was going to start so quickly and, uh, and anyway, so I relocated to Manchester early and stayed with some friends and started to do some gigs up there. But the gay scene's so small, it wouldn't matter if you're in Manchester or Newcastle. It wouldn't matter if you was in Timbuktu, if you're on the gay scene, you're famous everywhere really um, in that scene. And everything just started to catch up. 
and uh, basically the, the police had raided or questioned, in inverted commas, um, multiple of my friends. And they'd also raided the studio at a time when there was singers and bands and rappers and drag queens and everything all working and so obviously the news went straight like that but no one really had the facts because the only one who knew the facts was me and I hadn't, I hadn't disclosed the facts and um, anyway in between all this um, some nasty some nasty friends or I thought were friends had um, documents um, forged because I wasn't charged with anything at this point in fact I wasn't charged with anything for a year um, they didn't they didn't have any charges um, but a document had been faked and put on uh, whatsapp or whatever to people and it had been leaked onto uh, Facebook and it had my mum's address and telephone number on it and a whole list of fake fake charges and this um, escalated into fake news which had 10% of the truth in but 90% you know fiction you know the uh the, the news is like especially online where there's no there's no control at all and these blogs and fake news steps you know with along with facebook instagram twitter and everything else just went crazy and my name was absolute mud i was everything from from a from a, a serial pedophile to a rapist to a, to um to a uh, porno director producer of kiddie porn i mean there was nothing that porn said and uh and so obviously my life just fell apart and craig had to say bless his heart you know this is too hot for us at orange group and i understood that and i didn't want him to have any bad effect obviously i dropped from the white swan and, and central station and all my other venues and i stopped going to the studio i didn't want them to have any bad association with it and um, anyway the long and the short of it is my life um, fell apart and so um, I decided to go away for a while I hadn't been charged with anything and so I was a free man and um, I thought you know what I'm just gonna go away for a while I didn't take Craig up on his offer because I didn't want anything coming back to Orange Crew when he'd already been so good to me and um, and I just thought to myself, you know, let's get away. And uh, I, I just felt so, I just felt so suicidal at this point, um, because my name was Mud, and I sort of I'd lost everything. My, my you know, my whole career was in tatters. And I, anyway, so you know, I decided to to get away and do a runner, I suppose, away from away from the uh, the scandal for a while until it. What I presumed, but I thought it was going to blow over. I hadn't been charged with anything, and I thought that the gossip would just die down, and eventually I'd be able to tell my tale.
So my main confidant after I was arrested was obviously my best friend, um, Scott Jose. What I didn't realise was he was probably the worst person to confide anything in because, you know, he's got a, almost like a mental disorder where he has to <laughs> lie about things or exaggerate things out of all proportion and he does these multiple text messages and multiple whatsapp you know separately to each person like so so not on facebook and stuff so i didn't know he was doing it and i i, I don't know why i didn't think that he would but i just um he made it about a million times worse for not just for me but for everyone who'd been dragged into the whole terrible scenario you know friends that had been questioned my family my family were dragged through the mill and and my close friends were dragged through the mill unnecessarily a lot of it because it would have died down a lot quicker and it might never have even made the um the fake news stories had um had scott not obsessively sent all these um you know exaggerated versions of the truth to people multiple messages evidently sent you know, hundreds and hundreds of separate messages just enjoying the gossip. Anyway, I should have known him better. So, so I've, I've, you know, I've laughed at things before and um, I've been on the other side of it with him where, you know, it's hysterically funny or he just loves a drama. So, and, uh, you know, as a springboard to that, it was all other people, Johnny Robinson or Barber or whoever, I can't even think who, who were saying things now online, but they was almost like his puppets and, um, you know, believing everything he said, which is just so ridiculous, really, when I think about it. But I've been on the other side of it, and I've enjoyed people's scandals and gossip. So, you know, I guess it was only to be expected, but it did cause a lot of heartache for people. And also, at the time, I was still taking Scott's advice. You know, Scott's got a, a rich um, sugar daddy, Tim, and uh, he's always been involved in legal things and that, and I thought that Scott would... Be the best person to advise me and uh, yeah scott advised me basically to do a runner and just to just to disappear away from london and from the uk for a while and i turned down craig's offer to go to spain but really i needed to go where it wasn't going to harm other people because 
you know, however small my actions were or however immoral or illegal or whatever you want to call it, it's just, um, it, they've been exaggerated so much that the knock-on effects had a massive impact on my close friends and family and my loved ones and, and I'd hurt people through my actions that had been exaggerated out of all proportion and hurt them unnecessarily more than what they needed to be. So I took Scott's advice and I got on a plane and um, anyway, I ended up, a couple of long stories short, I ended up in uh, North Africa. I didn't tell anybody where I was and, you know, initially, initially, um, Obviously, I was I was devastated to leave mum and dad at a time when mum needed me. But to be honest, I was no help to them at that stage because I was just bringing harm to, to them. I mean, mum's address and telephone number were broadcast on Facebook and the internet and reposted on vigilante sites, um, which meant she was getting funny phone calls and all sorts of things and having to handle things. And... It was just better if I took myself out of her life for a while. And I thought it might even be a chance I might not even see my dad again because he could have just died while I was away. It was just a very traumatic period of time. However, initially when I got to Africa, um, just the relief of being away from all this scandal and upset and, and you know, and Initially, I did feel better. I've got to be honest. Out of you know, out of sight, out of mind. I wasn't on uh, you know uh, uh, social media and that. And I just uh, I just cleared my mind of it and tried to try to start a career maybe elsewhere and looking into things. Just needed to clear my head, and I, I cleared my head for a while. But in between all this, um, the uh, I, I'd had to swap from from Craig solicitor and 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 you know just in case I'd I'd, I'd got a duty solicitor in case there was any more repercussions. And um, anyway, so she would email me and stuff, but I wasn't even going on my emails. But I did um, I did uh, say if ever it was urgent, to con I didn't want her to contact my mother because I just didn't want mum having any more upset. And so I gave Kelly Kelly's details, my dear friend Kelly Wilde, and, and uh, so, that, um, so that if anything had happened, uh, Kelly could contact me anyway. Uh, eventually she did contact me and and she said that it was good news and uh, the police uh, basically they'd put it on the back burner and there weren't any charges being brought against me and she said why don't you come home and you know what I thought I've got to see my dad it was leading up to Christmas and I was so worried he was going to die over Christmas and I'd never see him again and um you know, he'd been in and out of hospital, he'd been in and out of the care home, and, and he, he was in a terrible state. So, look, so I got on a plane and I came back, and, you know, my parents were so pleased to see me for Christmas. I sent messages to a few close friends, and I said, look, look, he's been put on the back burner, it doesn't look like anything. You know, the police basically said they weren't going to bring any charges. And, uh, but yeah, but they were lying, as the police do, and I think they just wanted me to come back from being abroad. Um, but I'll go into the police matter, because um, there's so much corruption and lies. Um, but I'll go into the police matter later, and it's in detail in my book anyway. So in my couple's comments, so you'll be able to read it. So, so I head on back from, from North Africa, and I, I am very pleased to be on Christmas, but the vigilante problem had got out of control. News had got around that I was back, and I, I was having to go out in disguise. I mean, I couldn't go anywhere in Lewisham where I was living and certainly nowhere in London or Brighton or anywhere where people knew me. And uh, basically, I was just uh, in, uh, not seeing any friends at all, and just had the most awful, awful uh, Christmas and New Year. Although it was lovely to see my parents, but my dad was so ill by this point. And it got to just after New Year's Eve, and I thought, right, I'm just going to top myself. I just thought, like, this is ridiculous, isn't it? There's no way of coming back from all this um, scandal and this gossip. And, and you know, I, I, I was just starting to realise that um, 
people like Scott had been had been making things worse. When I, they was the people I was confiding in, and they was taking things out of context and using it against me. I didn't even realise that he'd testified to the police about me. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, look, that's that all I found out later. But I was going to kill myself, and uh, I was sitting there, and, and it was the middle of the night. And um, but I didn't. Um, I didn't even try that night. I just thought, right, one more attempt of, of going away because I couldn't do anything or go anywhere. I mean, there was vigilantes calling the house. I couldn't walk outside for fear of being killed. Um, and it was all, all over the media. I mean, the 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 vlogs and, and fake news had just got ridiculous, really. <laughs> it's laughable looking back on it, but I don't know how people even believe it and then people would add to it when they were saying things and I just you know I just thought I just can't live here. I, I just I just got it. anyway I got on a plane the next morning and ended up in South America and um I stayed there for a while but I was so depressed I, I, I hated it. I hated being in South America. I absolutely hated it and and I was so traumatized from knowing that dad was probably gonna pass away within months if not weeks and my mum needed me and I lived there for a while and and then I thought what am I doing I've got to go home and face the music so my second attempt at starting a new life failed miserably and um, and I came back with my tail between my legs and uh, anyway dad little did I know well I didn't know really, but he only had a few weeks to die um, well, actually, it was three months, three months. I came back and then the, uh, the start of the pandemic happened. And Dad had been having um, carers come in and help him. Run. And it was getting to the point where uh, they wanted him to go into a hospice. But then they made the announcement that anybody in a care home or hospice wasn't allowed any visitors. And Mum and me, we just, we couldn't bear that thought. And so... It was one of the reasons I came home, or the main reason I came home, and we, ju we just nursed Dad. And we nursed him, just the two of us, for, for three months. Um, his little arms, his little legs were like that. He, he, he couldn't speak in the end. And he, he was in a terrible way. Cancer is evil, isn't it? Cancer is evil. And he had dementia as well. And um, he was bed-bound. And... My mum, I don't know how she did it, you know, we was, we was uh, doing his bed baths, we was changing his nappies, he, he was completely incontinent and, and it, it was very sad to see your father wasting away to a skeleton, he looked like something out of Auschwitz, you know. And in between all this, I was having to avoid the phone, social media, mum was getting calls uh, even close friends of mine were calling and then just being abusive to my mum at a time when she was nursing my dad it was disgusting to be quite honest my mum had nothing to do with any of it whatever i may or may not be guilty of in people's eyes certainly my mother and my poor dying dad had nothing to do with it anyway the police made it a million times worse they had duped me into coming home and then they raided the flat again with me in it. I was reading a story to my dad off of his Kindle and then suddenly there was bangs at the door and it was the police again arresting me for the same crime that they'd already supposedly arrested me for, uh, that I supposedly had no charges for. Uh, they took all the computers again, all the phones and everything. I mean, I think they got about eight of my computer's phones. They even took my dad's Kindle. They even rolled my dad who was dying to look underneath him in bed because they're bloody disgusting. There was 15 of them for me, come on. And uh, they're not nice people, the police. I've had my views on change. I'm gonna talk about that, it's all in the book anyway because I've been digging ever since and found out scandalous things, especially Lewisham Police Station that involved in these murders and everything. And the Kent Police and then this turning out to be murderers. So. And, um, you know, they're all, you know, there's a lot of the uh, high authority people in the cult and everything, which I've been doing research on. But that's another story, and that's all in the book as well. But anyway, look, the long and the short of it is that it was evil then coming and doing that to my dad. 
when he was on his deathbed. And it was uh, evil to put my mum through that. And to be quite honest, it was very bad to pull me back from being away on false pretenses of charges. And then they had no, you know, they were just clutching at straws to try and find something I'd actually done that was illegal. So I found the whole scenario unbearable. And after the police raided, I made an excuse to my mum to leave the house. And I went to a friend's place and I sat in the spare room and I got hold of some uh, GHB GBL. I already had antidepressants, which I was on obviously, and I was on Valiums, and I was on a few different tablets from the doctor. And also I had paracetamol and everything, and I just took as many tablets, and as well as G and everything that I could. And uh, anyway, I didn't die. I got put in the shower by my friend who heard me tossing around the spare room on G. <laughs> I didn't go quietly and um, anyway, he saved my life. But anyway, look, the long and the short of it is this, I just, the guilt around the people I'd upset around my, my friendship circle, the people that have been unnecessarily devastated in their lives, that had a long-term friendship with me, the upset I'd caused for my family and the upset from my mum and my dad and my dad was dying and had his Kindle taken away. They also took out mum's phone. So we was we we was in lockdown with a dying man and we had no phone, no internet, no no way of contacting the outside world on landline or on mobiles. And the police think that's okay when when you're with a man who's only he only had two weeks to live after that, but you know. Anyway, so we nursed my dad, we spent, I spent my days changing nappies and trying to make his last couple of weeks as painless as possible. And um, but obviously he, he passed away. My mum knew that I tried to kill myself, she kept it from my dad. Um, when I came back uh, after you know, two days after the suicide attempt, I had to get myself together first and I went to friends. And, um, I just thought, Jason Prince, that's the most selfish thing you've ever done when your mum's here looking after your dad. But you just lose the plot when you try and kill yourself. You don't get see reason. And I, I didn't really have any reason to live. Um, anyway, so I carried on nursing dad and mum said, I've never seen someone pull it together so much. She knew I tried to kill myself. She must have just, my poor mum. I mean, can you imagine what she must have Anyway, um, I didn't kill myself. I, I I lived through it. Maybe the years of drug abuse, my body was so immune at the amount that I took. Maybe it just wasn't my time. Maybe it just wasn't my time. But I I nursed my dad. We we nursed him all in all for three months together, mum and me, with no outside help at all, no no uh, district nurses, nobody from the hospice. No, we did it all on our own. And the last two weeks were very intense. And then. Um, We'd been awake with Dad for about three nights because he was in so much pain. Uh, you know, we'd try and move him. It was just... When someone's that big on their arms and legs and just tired of them, they can't speak, he couldn't move from the, from the head down. It was just a very sad situation. And um, But Mum and me kept bright to him and bright to each other. And we saw it through to the end. And on, on the day that he died, It was a release that he'd gone, to be honest, because it was awful to see my mum have to nurse her husband of 60 years, you know. And it was just sad to see such a fantastic man lose his dignity like that. And uh, anyway, on the last day, mum and me had been awake for, for three days, three days and three nights with him. Mum never slept anyway. And they had two single beds in my my mum's room. And I'd been awake too for about three nights with him and uh, we just couldn't sleep because he was in so much pain and he couldn't really, and It was just very awful. Anyway, on the day that he passed, um, mum sat next to him and then I'd been holding him and cuddling him as much as I could and sitting on his bed. And then um, I said to dad, dad, do you mind if I just go and sit on mum's bed and have a little snooze? Because he looked 
as well. He could, and I used to talk to him as if he could reply, even though he couldn't speak. And I could just feel what he was thinking and, 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 and saying. And I just went and sat on mum's bed and I fell asleep. And then she sat and cuddled him. And she must have nodded off. And it's the first time we'd slept in three days and nights. And while he was asleep, he, he passed. And then I woke up, I think, because he was always gasping for breath. I woke up because I couldn't hear him gasping for breath. And I woke up and I, I saw that he was gone. And on the other bed, it was just, you could just see that he passed. And I went over and I checked and he wasn't breathing. And I, uh, I woke my mum and I said, Mum, Daddy's gone. And obviously she burst uh, she into tears and stuff. And just the usual sort of breathing. And I'm glad I was there. I'm glad that I didn't, I didn't stay away. I'm glad that I came back. I'm glad that I was there. My mum said that she'd never see anybody pull it together during that crisis, feeling suicidal as I did, to, to nurse dad with her. But I just thought she was the pillar of strength and we had mutual admiration for each other. When we phoned the undertakers, obviously, the, uh, well, there was no point having a funeral because basically my, my, all, of my, all, of, all of the friends had turned their back on me. Um, no one really knew what to say to her, so she didn't really have any friends, um, which is a very sad state of affairs when the husband died. I guess they just didn't know what to say to her because of me. Plus, we'd just gone into lockdown and we just thought we're not going to have a funeral because who would we have there? So we phoned an undertaker who did a, a, a cremation only service, but they couldn't come at that time because of the lockdown. So they had to talk me through what I had to do to get dad's body ready for them. So I had to do things like, you know, wash him completely, his, his body, and I had to straighten his limbs because he died in a fetal position because he was in so much pain. And uh, I had to straighten his legs and his arms and leave him in a position that the undertaker could just come in with the with the mask and just take the the body of my dad. And it was a very weird thing to have to do to to you know do an undertaker's job and to sort out the body of your late father. But, you know, it's just the body, the soul is gone and the soul is here on me and helping me do this video. Let's 
fly over the rainbow. Why do I can't I? One day I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops Away above the chimney tops That's where Let's fly over the rainbow Why, then why can't I? If happy little bluebirds fly Beyond the rainbow, why, oh why can't I?